Good morning, church. Good to see everybody here this morning. We are wrapping up our series on encountering Jesus. Next week we'll start a brand new series, and I'm excited about that. But today we're going to talk about Jesus at the well with the Samaritan woman. Now, it's hard for us really, you may know Jews and Samaritans didn't get along very well, but it's hard for us to really understand why and understand all the ins and outs of that situation like we really should if we're going to appreciate and understand this story. Imagine, you know, as, a, as an example, imagine if I told you a story from like 1950s Alabama. Okay, 1950s Alabama, and I told you that there was a white man and an African-American woman, right? You would sort of understand. I wouldn't have to fill you in on the details because you would understand why there was tension there, why there was a barrier there, why there would be a challenge for these two people to interact and, and have, a, have a friendship and have a conversation. You would sort of know the ins and outs of that cultural barrier that existed, but when we talk about Samaritans and Jews, why was there such a problem between these two groups of people? In fact, from the outside, they may have even looked like very similar types of people. You might not, as an outsider, may have even been able to tell there was any difference between the two groups of people. You see, the Samaria and the, the region around the city of Samaria was part of the northern kingdom of Israel. You remember the kingdom of Israel at one time was split into two. You had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And about 700 years before Jesus was even born, the kingdom of Assyria came in and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. That's where Samaria was. And they carried off a lot of the Israelites living there to other places in captivity. But they also, they did an unusual thing. They took people from other captive nations and they resettled them in Israel. I was trying to think, how, how could I, you know, how could we relate to that? Imagine if Germany had won World War II. And imagine if tons, uh, thousands, millions maybe of Americans had been deported to other countries. And then people from places like Poland and France were transported and, and resettled here in America. That's exactly the kind of thing that happened in Israel. So a lot of Israelites were taken off into captivity and other Gentile nations were resettled in Israel. And of course, the Israelites that were still living there married these Gentile people. And then later, the southern kingdom of Judah, it was destroyed by Babylon. Remember, Jerusalem was all destroyed and they were taken off into captivity. And then years later, finally, people began to come back and try to put the pieces back together, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple and all of those things in Jerusalem. And then they came across these Israelites that had been living in the land, that had married some of the other Gentile people. And during the days of Ezra, they instituted segregation policies that said, we're not going to have anything to do with you. But of course, the Samaritans, they felt like they were the faithful remnant of Abraham's people. They felt like what they were doing and who they were was pure and right and good. They had the Pentateuch. They had the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the law, the books of Moses. And they felt like what they were doing was what Israelites were supposed to do. And of course, the Jews felt like these people are compromised racially and compromised culturally and compromised uh, religiously. We don't want to have anything to do with them. But the feeling was, was kind of mutual. I think about it a lot like outsiders might look at Muslims. You know, you have Shia and Sunni Muslims. And, and from the outside, you might look at it and say, well, they're all, they're all one group. They're all Muslims. But on, if you're on the inside, you understand the tensions. You understand the conflict. You see, the, the, the people of, of Samaria, they, they felt like the true place of worship was Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim was the mountain that was in Samaria. This is a modern picture of it. It's still where modern day Samaritans feel like is the holy place. And they built a temple on Mount Gerizim because they believed this was the mountain on which Abraham went to sacrifice his son Isaac. And the Jews said, no, that's not the right place. And you're wrong for worshiping there. And you're wrong for having a temple there. And about 128 years before Jesus was born, the Jews went to Mount Gerizim and destroyed the Samaritan temple. And so these tensions, this conflict, this hatred of each other, this I'm 
part of the right group and my mountain is the right mountain our temple is the right temple Mount Gerizim is where you contact God and where you connect with God and where you worship God and then the other group saying no Jerusalem is the right place and you're compromised religiously and culturally and ethnically and this divide and this wall that existed had existed for a very long time so in with that in mind read John chapter 4 starting in verse 5 Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. See, these stories, Jacob and Joseph and Abraham, they're part of their shared heritage. This isn't just a Jewish story. You remember, uh, Jacob gave a plot, he owned a very small plot of land in the promised land, and he gave that plot of land to his son Joseph. And Joseph insisted that after the Israelites, hundreds of years later, when they went back to Canaan, they took Joseph's bones there to be buried in this plot of land, presumably in anticipation of the resurrection. This was their shared story. This was a plot of land that was part of their shared heritage. And Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, I didn't tell you in the beginning as I planned to, but I think as I've wrestled with this story over the last few months, I think I've misread this story. I think I've misunderstood the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. I think I've misunderstood the implications for us today. I think that I've given the Samaritan woman a bad rap. And it all starts right here in this verse. It was about the sixth hour, which means that it was about noon. And a lot of commentators have, have speculated and inferred from that. They say, well, what was a woman doing coming to get water at noon? It was hot and the sun would have been out and there's no reason she would have been coming at that time of day to get water. Really? They assume that it means she didn't have any friends, nobody liked her, she was ashamed, she was an outcast. Maybe, but it doesn't say that, does it? In fact, in fact, how do they, I always wonder, how, how do you know how hot it was that day, right? I mean, how do you know what the temperature was that day? They had hot days and cold days there, right? How do you know what the temperature was? How do you know there wasn't a whole lot going on at her house and she just needed some extra water at noon? You don't know? We make a whole lot of assumptions by assuming that her coming to get water at noon meant that she was an outcast. That isn't what the text says. In fact, I think it's better if we compare what's said here with the story we just read, right? I mean, if we were reading it like we were supposed to be, you know, reading the first of the book to the last of the book, we'd remember that the last story we just read was Nicodemus. And John told us then what time of day it was, didn't he? He said Nicodemus came at, at night, right? So it was dark when Nicodemus came. And now this woman comes in the light of day. And Jesus and Nicodemus had a conversation about those who loved the darkness versus those who loved the light. This is a great contrast story, and all through the story, we ought to be contrasting Jesus' conversation with this woman with the conversation he had with Nicodemus. You see, one was a conversation with a religious person. Here's a conversation with a common person. Here's a conversation with a Pharisee. Here's a conversation with a Jew, and here's a conversation with a Samaritan. Here's a conversation with a man. Here's a conversation with a woman. Here's a conversation where the man came in the dark, at night, and a conversation where a woman comes and meets Jesus in the full light of day. I think if we allow that to paint the picture, we might see this conversation in a whole nother light and understand this woman in a whole nother light. So the woman came, verse 7, woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. I mean, if this was a Jewish man and he felt like she was unclean because she was a, a woman of a compromised race, a woman of compromised religion, then there's no way that most Jews would drink from water that a Samaritan woman had drawn. And so she wants to know, what sort of Jew are you? What sort of Jew would ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? You know our history. You know our culture. You know the wall that exists between us. I imagine, I'm guessing, she was probably a little bit suspicious of his motives. Why in the world? What sort of Jew would ask me for a drink of water? And here's Jesus' reply. 
He answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to her, said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well's deep. Where, where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He was, he gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Now, again, Compare this conversation with the conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus, just the last chapter. John is telling us these two stories side by side so that we compare them and contrast them. And in the last story, Jesus told Nicodemus, listen, if you want to see and enter into the kingdom of God, you have to be born again, right? And, and Nicodemus is thinking very literally, right? He's thinking very naturally, and he says, born again? How's that possible? When somebody's old, how do they enter into their mother's womb again? That doesn't even make sense. And here, again, this woman is thinking very literally, very naturally. You say, you're going to give me water. I don't see, how are you going to draw it? What water are you talking about? Why are you, are you, you think you're better than Jacob? You know, I mean, so she's thinking very literally, again, so that we compare these two stories, and we compare these two people. Verse 13, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of, we of water welling up to eternal life. So let's, let's kind of park there for just a second and ask, what is... What is Jesus talking about? What is this water that he's talking about? There's sort of all different kinds of passages we could go to to help us to understand this. But I think one of the most helpful ones is Ezekiel 47. See, Ezekiel, when he was in Babylonian captivity, he had a vision. Here's a picture of, of the temple that he envisioned. And this isn't the temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians. And it wasn't even the temple that was going to be rebuilt after they came back from Babylonian captivity. It was a vision of a new temple temple a different kind of temple and one of the best features of this temple is there you see the river there's a river of life that flows out of this temple and it gets wider and it gets deeper and everywhere it goes and everything it touches and everyone it touches it brings life to them if this is what Jesus is talking about he's he's making and, and bringing temple imagery to to mind is John a, a gospel account that has a lot to do with temple imagery? Yes. In the gospel of John, who's the temple? I didn't say what's the temple. I said, who, who's the temple? It's Jesus, isn't it? We've said it from the very beginning, John chapter 1, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Jesus said, I'm the, the son of man on whom angels are going to be ascending and descending like, like on the house of God of Bethel. And, and then Jesus says, Tear down the temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. And John says he was talking about the temple of his body. All through the gospel of John, John wants us to understand that Jesus is the temple. You want to know where to go to connect with God? The answer is Jesus. And Jesus is beginning to paint this picture that from me, I'm the one. I'm the place where the river of life is going to spring from. And everywhere it goes... And everyone it touches, it's going to bring them life. And then if we were, again, to keep reading through the Gospel of John, we'd get to chapter 7 very quickly, wouldn't we? And in chapter 7, here's what it says in verse 37. Jesus is talking and he says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the, what? The spirit. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see the picture that Jesus is painting with this woman? He says, listen, if you knew who it was that was asking you for a drink of water, you would have asked him. Because he's the one, he is the temple from which the Spirit of God, like a river of water, is going to flow from. And everywhere it goes... And everyone it touches, it's going to bring them thirst-quenching life, right? That's what he's saying to this woman. If you knew who I was, you would know that I'm the one from whom this living water is going to flow. Verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water. <laughs> Don't you love that? I mean, gone is the indignation, like, what are you saying? Are you saying you're better than Jacob? We got water right here. This is just fine water. I don't know what you're talking bad about. Our... That's not what she says. She says, okay, 
sold. I want some, right? Give me some of this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Of course, she's still thinking very literally, but she's saying whatever it is that you're offering, I want it. I want it. That sounds wonderful. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Here's where it gets interesting. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now, most commentators, almost every commentator, not everyone, but, but almost everyone, and I have, assumed that this woman was divorced and remarried five different times. Now she's shacked up with some guy because she's bad. She's sinful. Some reason she just kept going from guy to guy to guy. Now, does the text say that? Does the text say that she was sinful and bad and wrong? No, that's, a, that's an inference that we have drawn. I think about John chapter 8. You remember John chapter 8? This woman caught in adultery is brought before Jesus. And at the end of that conversation, he says, go and sin no more. He doesn't say anything like that to this woman. Yet, we assume you've had five husbands and now you're with a guy that's not your husband. We assume it's because you're bad. You did something bad. You're sinful. You're wicked. Why do, we, why do we assume that? Especially when we know that in the ancient world, divorces were almost always brought about by the man and not by the woman. I mean, I guess it's possible that maybe she had committed adultery five different times and every guy had put her away and now she's with some other guy. Maybe that's possible, but chances are if that was the case, she would have been stoned before she was remarried five different times. It's possible that she was bad but it's more likely, it's more likely she was the victim here. That time after time after time after time she had been mistreated by man after man after man after man. That she had been treated like a commodity for years. And isn't it shameful that we just assume she's the bad guy in this situation? And don't we do that too often? Aren't we like the people in John chapter 8 that brought the woman to Jesus and said, hey, we caught her in the very act of, the, of adultery, and we've rightly asked, where's the guy? Why do you assume it's all her fault? And yeah, she had been sinning, but we put all the blame on her. And here's a woman, there's no indication in the text whatsoever that she was at fault. Maybe, just maybe, she had been victimized Year after year after year after year, man after man after man, and here Jesus says, I see you. See, because that's the point of the story. It's not whether she was wrong or whether she was right, whether she was good or whether she was bad. It's that Jesus knew her. And then, and then the key word in this entire conversation right here is when Jesus says, what you have said is true. You are a person. When I asked you about your husband, you spoke truth. See, that's what this whole conversation about is about what is real, what is true, versus the things that only appear to be true. Verse 19, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, I've always assumed, because I... I pegged her as a bad guy, that she was just sort of changing the subject. She's a little bit uncomfortable. You're talking about my marriages, so I'm going to change the subject. Maybe so. Maybe that's the case. Most commentators think that's the way it is. Or, or maybe she's honestly saying, I, you're a prophet. There's no way you could have known this unless God told you. And isn't it amazing what she asks about? She says, sir, I, I perceive that you're a prophet. She says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, Gerizim. But you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. She's, she's asking about the heart of the conflict, the heart of the wall that exists between her people and Jesus' people. And she wants to know what's true. What's true? What's real? Where do I really go to connect with God? She meets a prophet. And she doesn't ask, you know, like, what are the winning lottery numbers going to be? No, she wants to know. She says, I want to know about God. 
I want to know about where's the real place, the true place to connect with God. Is it Gerizim, as my people say, or is it Jerusalem, as your people say? Where do I go to worship God? Where do I go to connect with God? What is true? What is real? If you're from God, you would know the answer. And if I have an opportunity to ask a man of God something, here's what I want to know. Where do I connect with God? Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. See, it's a temple conversation, and John has been leading up to this. We've, he's introduced us to this temple idea and this temple language. We already know the answer, don't we? Before we read Jesus' answer, we know what it's going to be. She wants to know, Gerizim or Jerusalem? And Jesus says, neither. Why? Because where is the temple? It's Jesus. Y you want to know where to connect with God? I'm the way to connect with God. You want to meet the Father? I'll show you the Father. You want to be connected to Him? I'll connect you to Him. You want to worship Him? I'll make you a worshiper of Him. You want to come into His kingdom? I'll help you come into His kingdom. You want the temple? I am the temple. You want truth? You're seeking truth? You're here and you see me in the full light of day? You want the truth? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship, as Samaritans, you worship what you don't know. And we worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming. And now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking such people to worship him. What kind of people? True worshipers. As those who merely, as opposed to those who merely appear to be true worshipers. And again, if we're still contrasting this with the story of Nicodemus, Nicodemus appeared, and everybody like Nicodemus appeared to be true worshipers, right? They were religious, and they were Pharisees, and they stood away from bad stuff, and they separated themselves, and they were pious and religious and ceremonial. But Jesus is saying God is seeking true worshipers to worship him. I mean, I, I see in there an implication that he's saying, like you. God is seeking true worshipers like you to worship him. Because here's a woman who wants to know truth. When asked about her life and her family, she speaks truth. When she has an opportunity to question a prophet, she seeks truth. And Jesus is saying, God wants such people to worship him. True Worshippers, those that love the light and care about the truth. Now, again, this phrase, verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, again, I've misread that for so many years. I mean, what does he mean by spirit? I mean, spirit could mean lots of things. There's lots of spirits. You know, what spirit are we talking about? And I've assumed that the spirit, like worshiping God in spirit, means I worship God with enthusiasm and with my heart and with my spirit. And I worship God like I really mean it. Mm. If I read through the book of John, if you read through the book of John, you'll never find anyone using the word spirit like that in the book of John. But in this context... And all throughout the, the book of John, right here, are we talking about a spirit? Yes. Jesus is talking about this living water that's going to flow out from him, from the new temple, to all the world and bring life. And that is the spirit. In John chapter 3, the story with Nicodemus, was he talking about a spirit? Yes. And how the spirit causes people to be reborn so that they can see and enter into the kingdom of God. In what spirit do we worship the Father? His spirit. It's not about my spirit. It's about his spirit that's going to flow out from Jesus to all the world and is going to bring us life and make us true worshipers of the Father. This is a temple conversation. And the, the question is, is it Gerizim temple or Jerusalem temple? And Jesus is saying it's neither. It's spirit and truth temple. You want to know in what temple to worship? It's the temple of spirit and truth. I love the way, like the NIV reads. It says, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. And, and I love, this is probably my favorite, the Good News translation says this, God is spirit, and only by the power of his spirit 
can people worship him as he tr really is? There's the truth. As he really is. Only by the power of his spirit can people worship him as he really is. Paul says something very similar. Philippians 3 and verse 3. He says, for we, we are the circumcision. Not the Jews, but we are the circumcision. Who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. This is a temple conversation. Jesus is bringing together Samaritans and Jews, all of the lost sheep of Israel. And eventually he'll bring in those who are not of that fold, us, all of us Gentiles. He's going to bring us in so that we can worship in the temple of spirit and truth. Who, what is the truth? Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. Now, verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. Now, I've always taken this as kind of her way of just kind of saying, well, who knows? You know, I don't know. You know, you're saying all this stuff, and who knows? You know, when the Messiah gets here, he'll explain all of that. Maybe that's what she's doing. Or maybe she's hinting at a reality that she's already begun to see. Maybe she's saying something like, it seems like what you're saying Sounds like what the Messiah is going to be saying. It seems like the things that you're telling me about, the things that you're revealing, and the things that you're saying are the sorts of things that we've been waiting for someone to say. We knew that Messiah was going to come. And the things that you're saying, it sounds like what he's going to explain to us. And Jesus confirms it and says, I who speak to you am he. And then, of course, the woman runs to town and she tells everybody, come, come. Listen to this guy. Hear him. He very well might be the Messiah. And they all come. And over the next two days, Jesus reaps a harvest of true worshipers. Those who love the light. Those that are seeking the truth. And so, and I've been wrestling with this story over the last week or so. Asking all of these questions that it, it makes me ask of myself. Because this, this is a story about real spirituality as opposed to just religion and, and, and ceremony and tradition and looking pious and looking spiritual and looking religious, because it's one thing to do that. But it's another thing to be a seeker of truth, truth that absolutely will turn your world upside down if you'll let it. And here was a woman, and she said, this water, I want it. This truth, I want it. Why? Because she loved the light. And so here's some questions that we got to ask ourselves. One, am I a person who loves the light? Am I a person who loves the light? Two, am I a person who is seeking truth? Am I thirsty for the truth? Number three, am I a person who wants the truth no matter how it changes my life? Can you imagine how this truth that she came into contact with, how it changed her life? It's not Gerizim anymore. What? Can you imagine her saying to her friends and to her family and to her neighbors, it's not Gerizim, that's not the holy one, that's not the holy place. Where's the holy place? Jesus of Nazareth. A Jew? Yes, salvation is from the Jew. Are you saying you're going to Jerusalem? No, it's not Jerusalem either. It's spirit and it's truth. And when you accept the truth, it'll change your relationships with your family. And sometimes it might be a painful change. When you accept the truth, it, it may change your relationship with your friends and your neighbors. Are you willing for your world to absolutely be turned upside down by a true spirituality? By not being satisfied with just going through the motions, but allowing this living water to quench your thirst? Number four, am I a true worshiper? The words of Jesus keep echoing in my mind. If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. There's a lot of us that we're still thirsty. We're here, and we go through the motions, and we know about Jesus, and we know all of that, but we're still thirsty. Because even though the, the life giver and the thirst quencher is right there in front of us, we haven't allowed this truth to change our lives. This woman had a moment of truth where she had to decide, who is this person that's speaking to me? 
And you and I, we have a moment of truth. Here's what we need to ask. Have you received the living water and come alive so as to be a true worshiper in the temple of spirit and truth? Maybe, maybe you, you haven't made that decision at all and you haven't come to Jesus and allowed him to give you this living water, the spirit of God, and change your life. Or maybe you have, but over time you've sort of walked away from the living water and you're thirsty. And you've been trying to find that thirst quench all kinds of places. You've tried to have other people and other things and other ideas and other philosophies quench your thirst when Jesus is the only one who does. And he's right there. Are you a seeker of truth? Do you love the light? Are you a true worshiper? Maybe we can help you. Maybe we can help each other. Let the shepherds pray with you or visit with you. We would love nothing more than to help you receive this gift by being baptized into Jesus or to pray with you, encourage you, anything we can do for you this morning. Now's a great opportunity. Come forward as we stand and sing.